Uh, it's I, I cannot see whether there are people in the recording, but I'm I'm as it is four o'clock. I'm just going to wait a minute or two for more people to join. Yes, we've just got uh, Mia. We just got some people coming in now, so we'll just give them a give them a few moments to arrive, and then we can make a start. Perfect. You can just give me a thumbs up and I will be happy to. I will indeed. Know. I will do that. Thank you. Yep, yeah, we've still got a, a few coming in. Let's give it a, a, a few more seconds, and then I think we'll uh, we'll make a start. Perfect. Okay, Mia. Let's uh, let's make a start, shall we? Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Um, to our webinar on how to place students' mental health and well-being at the center of your school culture. Um, we are Stanford American School in Hong Kong, um, collaborating with um, STEER um, uh, to explain to you how we use our data. And we are very, um, thank you very much for coming today. And we hope you find it um, as valuable as we find using it and sharing the information. Um, I would just like to start off by um, thanking Steer and thank you, Robert from Steer, if you can start us off. Lovely. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Mia, and to to Jenny and Joe for joining us this morning or the the afternoon um, in your time. And and thank you for the introduction and welcome. Uh, and welcome to those who are who are watching either live uh, as we are or on the recording later on. Uh, and uh, it's a great opportunity, really, to showcase. Uh, what the Stanford American uh, School do in Hong Kong so incredibly well, uh, and also to demonstrate what is uh, a quite a remarkably powerful tool uh, that enables you to track, uh, measure and improve the mental health of all your pupils by being very predictive, preventative and precise. I'm first going to ask Trevor, a member of the STEER team, just to explain briefly what STEER does. And then we'll ask Mia, Jenny and Joe about uh, what they've been doing and how they've been using STEER so effectively uh, over the last uh, over the last couple of years. So, Trevor, over to you, first of all, just to give a, a quick pricey of uh, of what STEER does. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you uh, for your time. So um, STEER as a company was founded 10 years ago. Um, to equip schools to proactively safeguard their students' well-being and mental health. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? So if you imagine adolescence as a road between childhood and adulthood that young people have to steer, we know a number of students who are socially, emotionally crashing is increasing. So STEER set out to equip teachers to act earlier, to identify and support students who are struggling to steer before they crash. So we do this by measuring something very different from traditional self-reports. You'll be familiar with assessments which ask students explicit questions about such things as bullying and self-harm or anxiety. Um, and whilst these are important, these questions are very easy for students to filter uh, what they tell you, and um, which means some students' risks will remain hidden. And secondly, their responses alert you to current risks that you probably already know about. So the STEER assessment identifies students with hidden or emerging risks by asking a different set of questions, questions which measure how the student is self-regulating or steering four factors uh, foundational to um, social and emotional well-being uh, and sustained academic progress. The first one is uh, self-disclosure, which is how much students share or keep private what they're thinking and feeling. The second is trust of self, which is how much students trust or question themselves. Thirdly, trust of others, 
how much students trust or question other people. And lastly, seeking change, how much students seek or limit change. Most of your students will steer these factors in a healthy way, making wise choices, uh, depending on who they are with or what they're doing. But some students struggle uh, increasing their risks of crashing, knowing who they are and what they are struggling with early enough enables teachers to be proactive, preventative and precise, giving the right student the right signpost at the right time. So we're, we're not just stopping students from crashing, we're teaching students to steer, uh, which is such an important skill for life uh, in and out and beyond school. So uh, what will steer enable teachers to do? So firstly, one is very importantly, hear every student's voice every term, every year through the 10 minute online assessment. Secondly, to build a longitudinal narrative of each student's social emotional steering from the age of eight to 18. Thirdly, to prioritize students with emerging or hidden risks, both in and out of school. Fourthly, to write targeted action plans to reduce the risks and teaching healthy steering. And then lastly, measure what impact um, those plans have had. So uh, that, that's a, a, a summary of what STEER provides. Thank you very much indeed, Trevor. That's uh, that's that's incredibly helpful. Um, for those of you who would like, there is a question and answer button, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. So if you do have any questions you want to put uh, put to anyone, please do put them in there. Trevor will uh, will also have a look at those and answer and he can. Uh, and if there are any that would be would be good to bring up, then we'll we'll do so at the end. But first of all, um, if uh, Mia, if I may start with you, uh, and again, thank you for sort of sharing some of your data and some of your slides so that we get a good uh, understanding, really, of, of how you're using STEER. Um, if I could first just ask you to tell us a little bit about your school uh, and the role, and I'm just going to share my screen uh, so that I can enable people to see various slides um, and, uh, and then... Um, over to you, Mia, on, on a, bad, a bit about the school and, and a bit about uh, your roles as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Oh, I'm just checking the sound there. I thought I had some feedback, but it sounds good. Can you hear me? A thumbs up. All, all good. Thank you. All good. OK. Um, thank you very much. We are Stanford American School in Hong Kong. Um, we are now six and a half years old. Um, uh, we started um, in Hong Kong. Uh, we have a sister school in um, um, Singapore, and we belong to um, Cognita, the the group that um, oversees about seventy or eighty schools. We started when we started six and a half years ago with about three hundred and twenty students, and we've now grown to a thousand students. We are um, K to twelve international school in Hong Kong, where we cater to students. Um, from all different nationalities, but we also have local students um, and many from many different countries, but also a lot of children from, from uh, the region, from Asia. Um, just as our school has grown, our support department has grown. Um, I started five years ago as one of two counselors, um, and now we are five counselors in our team. And today you are lucky enough to have three of our counselors, which is myself. I'm the elementary school counselor, but I'm also the um, head of the student support department. And then uh, later on, you'll get to meet Jenny and Joe. And we're an amazing team, even if I have to say so myself, but it's a lovely <laughs> team where we really do our very best to support the students um, and all student well-being. Uh, and uh, yes, and then uh, we use STEER, but I'll, but I'll get to that when you come to me. So um, that's just a little bit about our school. Um, we have, as I said, grown, but also we have had a, a period of time through COVID where we didn't grow. So we, we exploded like in the first two years, and then we had two years of not growing at all, and then we're currently exploding again. And I'm and I'm mentioning COVID because later on it also has a big um, influence when I talk a little bit about, about the social and emotional skills of our students. Brilliant, thank you. So, so what was it, or why was it that you decided to use and introduce Steer uh, as a as a as a tracking tool in in your school? You know, Robert, it was actually I first got to get to know Steer. 
um, when Cognito said, when Cognito reached out to us um, in, in Hong Kong and said, we're trialing, uh, trialing steer, and uh, this was in 2020 that we started working, um, and a couple of the Cognito schools worked together, and we all looked to see exactly what it is that we needed and how this brand new tool, or that was brand new to us at that time, can really support our students' social and emotional well-being um, and uh, their overall well-being. And um, as um, uh, Trevor explained a little bit earlier, that um, um, STEER gives us the opportunity to teach the students how to STEER. So we are a very much a data-driven school. Um, we have different points of data. Um, on this slide, you can just see that STEER is one of five points of data that we do at various times in the year with all of the students because we need to triangulate the data to make sure that um, what we see is what we what what is really happening within our population. But what I what we really liked about STEER, so we were introduced to it through Cognita, and then we started using it, and um and then what we really liked about it is that it that it was really filling on our data. It was giving us another layer to the data that we already had that enabled us to make sure that we that we find those students that do need our support. You know how easy it is um, in, in a school of a thousand children that somebody slips through the cracks. And this is just another layer and a safety net for us that we are um, very happy to use and that is very helpful for us as counselors and a student support team. And I think that's a really important uh, part that you've just mentioned, isn't it? That it's one piece of a of a bigger jigsaw puzzle. But as you say, it uncovers those sort of hidden unconscious areas that perhaps other, other assessments might not be able to pick up. One thing that would be, I think, interesting for the, the listeners to understand, obviously it started in the UK. And as Trevor said, it's been going for about 15 years, but it's not UK centric at all, is it? Um, it's very wow. much it can be adapted um, in any in any country in any culture. No, exactly. It is. Um, we we see it especially for us as an international school where we have so many different students from different backgrounds, from different cultures, um, um, even with different languages. We found that Steer is a tool that we can use that the students understand. Um, it is a. Uh, Steer um, asks the children to listen to questions for ten minutes, so they all sit with their with their with their headphones on. And um, as it's not conventional questions, as it's not explicit questions, which are questions that we ask, but we've asked in the other five areas or, or other four areas that you see there. These questions make them think about their space and how they define their space. And it's almost like they, the questions ask them to form a visual idea of where they are and then, and then ask them questions that gives us ideas of their biases, which we will also explain a little bit more later. Um, we find that the children um, that come from, especially the ones that come from different backgrounds or that, that come from um, different ideas of what makes them feel safe, which is a, a question that we usually ask, or um, what is it, uh, do they have a trusted adult? Those are very um, ideas that we are used to, but not every other student that comes to our school from a, from a different school. And this question, the questions that steers that STEER do ask the students um, gives them the opportunity to really show where they are and, within and this path. Yeah, and, and I think that leads us nicely, doesn't it, into into that question of how is the 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 assessment different from other assessments that you might have seen or might have done? Um, can you explain a little bit? I mean, you've talked a little bit about the imagination and the space. Can you just talk a little bit about how the assessment is different to other well-being surveys? Yes, I can definitely. The first thing that I want to say is it's it's really a quick assessment. It's only really a ten minute assessment, so it's so it's an easy assessment to do um, uh, for this for the students to complete as well. And especially if they've done it more than once, they understand the the setup behind it. Um, what makes a difference is that there's no explicit questions. Um, as I said, it's an imagination thing and it has an audio component. So it's not just reading, it's also listening to the questions that are asked, which makes it easier for them. But then um, once we've done that and once all the students have done that, 
um, STEER gives us a, a very rich data that um, can help us to analyze and and just the way in which we can present the data then and then connect it to the other to the other platforms um, is really unique. Where um, other forms that we do have also give us data, but we find the the data that STEER give us very useful and very easy to organize because it's already on that platform. Some of the things that we do, like contextual safeguarding, is a picture that the students draw and we have to go back and we have to go look at it and we collect the data on a different way. So um, this is one of the areas that, that make the STEER assessment really easy to use. And, oh, I can hear myself talk. That makes it easy to use and then makes it um, so valuable because we can add to the data that we already have. In our study questions, um, we, we ask direct questions to the students and we can only, is, it, is, the, is the sound okay? Yeah, 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 you're coming through nicely. Okay. When, we, when we ask questions and we ask direct questions, we find that some students, um, especially some of the older students, can sometimes mm, not be 100% truthful because they don't want you to know. Um, if they don't have a trusted adult, but they know what the answer is that you want to know. So they're giving you that answer. <laughs> and that is where STEER is quite different because it gives you, um, it's not asking you a direct question. It's not asking you how you're feeling today or if you're happy with your school. It gives you an, an imaginary space where you are and then it asks you questions about your boundaries and how to move the boundaries and who's welcome inside and outside of your boundaries. And that makes it that the student does not know exactly what you're targeting, but yet it targets those questions. It gets you those answers from the students that might not even know themselves that they th that they are um, heading towards a signpost or heading towards an area where they need some help with steering. And yeah, I think that's a really important difference, isn't it? Is the fact that, that the questions aren't closed questions and they're they are looking forward, aren't they? Um, as opposed to looking in the rear view mirror. Um, they're looking as to how a pupil may react and therefore the support that you can put in. Um, and yeah, no, it's good to bring up the 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 length of the assessment. It is just 10 minutes uh, and once a term. So you're you're tracking every pupil every term and seeing that um that progress uh, as they uh, as they go along and one of the things i was just going to ask actually is that um uh, within the staff there is a shared language isn't there which is very helpful when when understanding pupils and and that sort of yes. longitudinal narrative yes and 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 definitely as we've continued using steer um, and we all start at understanding what self-disclosure is. The platform itself also makes it easy to see those definitions. But um, talking about self-disclosure, talking about trust of self, trust of others and seeking change um, is a language that, that we um, use amongst ourselves so that we can better understand um, where the children are and their needs specifically. Yeah, no, that's it. It is incredibly helpful. Um, and Jenny, if I can, if I can move on to you, if I may, um, what what does the data give give you that perhaps other surveys might not? Yeah, so I think Mia's done a great job of explaining how the assessment is delivered to students and their experience of it. And um, I do think it's really important to note that those more savvy students um, absolutely may you know, try and minimize or or not be transparent about certain things that they don't actually want to be flagged. And, and understandably, um, they may feel that, but also it's important that we have a mechanism by which we might um, gain more insight, especially if there are risks or their mental health, um, you know, if, if there are flags there that really do need um, follow up. So um, what you can see on the screen is kind of a, a snapshot of what it looks like within the platform. So I can kind of talk through, you know, once we have the data from students, they've done the the audio assessment, um, you can see, so it's anonymized on the left side where it's a bit blurry. So each of those rows would be a student um, and they've been flagged as priority students. So that's the next um, column over. And then each of those areas, so self-disclosure, trust of self, trust of others seeking change, those are areas of potential um, hidden bias or composite bias. And um, there's a home uh, component and or a school component and an outside component. Um, so that really helps us also understand how, um, for certain individuals, we may see uh, behavior or um, certain trends in or patterns at school that may not 
they may not uh, represent at home in the same way. And it also helps us to kind of understand how um, these might impact them. So you can also see from the color scheme and the numbers kind of where they would be ranking based on their um, answers during the assessment. So this data is obviously quite clear, quite user friendly in terms of the breakdown um, and how that would later, um, you know, these, these students are brought to the top of a list and you can filter by certain um, bias, you can filter by certain class or group or uh, prioritization. If you look at the second student down, um, second row down, there's also a hidden vulnerability um, element. That's a, it's a little cut off in the screenshot, but you can see that there might be something to ex further to explore for that particular student. Um, um, and so this allows us to, um, again, triangulating with the other data points that we have from students um, to kind of check who these who these students are that are being flagged by the system, um, whether we were previously aware of what come up. So maybe it, you know, corroborates, it kind of aligns well with students in need of, of student support services and making sure that we have, um, you know, adequate capacity and we're meeting those needs through our, our counseling caseload or other areas of student support. Um, but it also, I think the really helpful thing is those students who may have slipped, you know, through the radar, um, under the radar, um, and it, it really allows them to express themselves in ways that may not, um, come through in some of the other assessments. So those, that very individualized, um, breakdown of, um, potential areas of need that they have. Um, obviously as we use this platform as, as we use STEER over time, we also have um, an eye on trends. So that will allow us to see how students, you know, if they've been with us for several years and we're using STEER over time, we see those patterns. So we might see um, the impact of, of action plans. Um, we may see, you know, needs that were apparent, let's say the first year back, um, you know, last year was Hong Kong's first year uh, back in school in person. Um, so we may have seen some needs emerging that are now no longer flagging. So that really allows us to kind of track data over time, which is really helpful. Um, and yeah, I think one of the one of the really big things is this um, this platform really allows us, as Joe's going to walk us through in a, in a little bit, but to to do that that planning stage. So we have all this data in one place, and then we're able to kind of filter through the needs that we as a department have, whether that's counseling individual students, um, groups, or kind of on a cohort or class level. So those, so those red, the, the little red flags that we see, um, those mm -hmm. are identifying your priority students, aren't they? So it's, it's very easy for you to see, actually, who are my, who are my priority students? And, and as, right. as you point out, you know, all those, all those data numbers come directly, don't they, from the the question or how they've answered the particular questions. Um, and and it's, it's interesting just to pick up on, on what you said there about being able to see the difference between how they respond out of school and how they respond in school to see uh, whether there are protective factors, risk factors in, in either of those uh, in either of those two areas. So it's, it's right. I think that you can see you can see both there is, is very helpful, isn't it? Absolutely. And again, coming back to kind of well-being, more more broad well-being and safeguarding, you know, we might also from this pick up where, you know, school could be a, a more challenging component of their experience versus home um, and where those protective factors and risk factors lie when Absolutely. we're supporting them. And and some of you might be able to see on the left there, the there is a, a module on safeguarding, um, which uh, which picks up again students who might who might be coming onto your onto your radar. Um, and certainly, I think one of the interesting things that I always found in school was those pupils who you didn't expect to come. Up, um, and, and those are often the most interesting, aren't they? The ones which you thought, gosh, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had him coming up as a priority pupil, which enables you to answer right. those interesting questions. I, I would also kind of flip it on its head. So sometimes we have students who we consider to be very high need in other areas and maybe we can look at how they how they came through on STEER um, and we're able to, you know, to find um, positives and to reinforce some of the things that they're doing well um, and their self-regulation in a way that's going to be, you know, affirming for them or, or supportive of the progress that they've made. So I think it can also, it can kind of work from both directions. We, we do tend to discover some students who may have surprised us or flown under the radar, but likewise, we can kind of cross-check with students who we, you know, we support regularly, but also... Um, let's say managing certain areas of self-regulation really well. No, thank you. Yeah, that's that's incredibly helpful. Um, uh, Jenny, did you want to, to go through these these next ones? 
um, in terms of sure. what we're seeing here? Yeah, so we've gone from kind of looking at the overall list of or selection of students. So this would be if you clicked on an individual student, you would see this more detailed breakdown. Um, so we can see this student has, you know, on the left side, we'll see where they kind of rank in terms of those various biases. Um, we can see trends over time and you can um, change the assessment um, to focus on certain ones. Um, and obviously those risks are very specific to the student based on their answers. So where we see that list of risks, we would then be able to click on any of those and make that a focal point for planning um, based on our knowledge of the students. So, you know, as counselors, we already often do have pre-existing knowledge of, of our students based on, you know, our, our more general interactions or working with them, but this might allow us to kind of hone in on one particular area of need um, and, and provide support um, by going through the planning process that the STEER platform offers us. So where you see the action plan um, component, that's where this can be very personalized for students that we work with one-on-one -on -one, um, based on the, you know, kind of what we identify as one of the priority um, areas to focus on. And it's interesting looking at this particular student, isn't it, where there was a big change between March 21 and October 20, um, where mm. some of the, the, the data became less healthy. And, and I think being able to track over time uh, is uh, is really important, isn't it? Um, and if I move on, so this is what you were talking about in terms of looking at uh, one of the factors in this one, self-disclosure. Right. So we might choose one particular area or factor. So the student has you know, quite low self-disclosure. Um, and this also helps us understand what exactly that means. Um, so again, you know, having common language to discuss um, self-regulation and student need is really helpful. Um, and so throughout the platform, there are also reminders of how you know, this language relates to the student's experience. Um, and there's breakdowns and kind of, of the terminology, which is really useful. Um, so you can see once we've chosen that particular um, bias, self-disclosure, so we can see over time, we can also look at um, what potential risks that student might face. So we may be aware already of some of them, but it can help, help us bear in mind that more broad, um, you know, those more broad risk factors, or you know, if the student changes environments, we're aware of the comparison between school and outside of school, so we may, you know, be on the alert for certain um, one certain context over another. Um, where it has the self my self disclosure responses, um, this is this kind of gives a clue of um, you know these are the answers that the student gave, um, which gives some insight and. Um, if you look at my imagined space, this is kind of linking back to when they were doing the assessment. Um, you know, how does it feel to be me? That's, that's actually a button you can click on to kind of give some perspective on the experience of the student whose profile we're looking at. And so zoomed in even further, thank you. <laughs> zoomed in even further. So this is, you know, a, a very detailed description, in fact, of um, potentially some of the experience of this student when they, um, in terms of, hiding or or low self-disclosure meaning that they are not conveying their true thoughts and feelings in this school context to an extent that it has flagged um, and that just means that they may not be likely to turn to adults for support they may not be likely to um, you know share when something's going on and so we may not um, have them coming to us for for help we may need to be you know proactive or to help them build skills um, to make sure that they any support that they need will be available to them and if I just go back to that one quickly, I mean, those mm -hmm. those responses really give you an insight, don't they, into into how a pupil is thinking and feeling, which um, is is incredibly valuable. I think particularly in that sort of counselling role, um, but also as, as a tutor in terms of understanding uh, how a how a pupil is is thinking, how they're feeling and how they might uh, how they might react. Um, and if I just go on one, obviously, these are the. Uh, these are the risks that you can see up in that um, up in the corner there. So it's breaking exactly. down risks into different categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so each of those risks, obviously, they may not all be true for a student. So we are looking at kind of some some broad um, some some things which may track for the student or they may not. But it's really helpful to bear in mind. And so we may, you know, depending on the situation, want to. Um, share with a homeroom teacher. So our, ours, ours is an American school, so the structure is going to be a little bit different from other schools potentially, um, or if we're talking with guests who work in a British system. Um, but, you know, we would have 
counselors would have this information, but we may share, um, as long as it's not too confidential, we may share certain uh, things to bear in mind with homeroom teachers or with other teachers who support the students closely, um, just in terms of potentialities a student might have, something to look out for, even to check if this is something that tracks in their work with the student. And, and I think it's important to say at this stage, isn't it, that also these are potential risks. They're not necessarily there now. Um, but if if, uh, if a student maintains these patterns of thinking, uh, then these are the, the risks associated, aren't they, with those that longer term uh, issues, which is where you can be very proactive. Um, exactly. Yeah. So thank you very much, Jenny. That was incredibly, incredibly clear and concise. Um, Joe, if we could move on to you at this stage. Um, so which staff are we are you um are involved really and and how do you go about training them so primarily it's just the counseling team that uh, engages with as tracker so we um help coordinate across um our different homerooms or tutor groups to be able to uh, take do the assessments um, manage the data and then look at all the data to plan and use it training wise there are some awesome videos that we were you know, obviously looking at before starting. Um, they're accessible at any point. So sometimes, maybe that's just my personal experience, maybe not with me and Jenny, I got a bit overwhelmed with the new terminology. I could dip back into that, um, familiarize myself with things like that. Um, Leslie's not on this call, but she's lovely. Um, Steer have been incredibly helpful providing personal support. So being able to reach out and um, ask questions and queries and nuanced ways of, you know, can I use it in this way? Or, you know, these types of ideas um, relevant. So actually getting to engage with you guys was a big um, way that I learned about how to use this uh, properly. But, you know, even when you are using it and you're creating the individual plans or cohort plans or group plans, or whatever it might be, along the way, there is a, you know, always uh, learn more or find out more about this composite bias. So you're always sort of left there with the information when you need it, even if you're kind of still trying to learn it. Um, it has all these prompts at different levels that um, I found really useful in, in learning how to deploy the system effectively. And, and one of the one of the areas which we have uh, introduced very recently is that the online training is now CPD accredited. So every member of staff who takes the uh, who does the online training can download an accredited certificate uh, in terms of their of terms of their training, which is very useful for their own their own career development and and, uh, and personal development, uh, which I think is is incredibly useful. Uh, oops, I've gone on one too far. Um, Jenny, I think we're coming back to you at the stage, um, and then we'll come back, come back to to oh, is that uh, Joe? Are you you've got to. So it'll just be me for for, for the uh, trends and uh, oh, okay. plans and things. So once, so once that data's in, um, sort of trends, report writing, allocating time, etc. How do you go about that as a school? Um, well, I mean, there are different levels with it. So um, what we've got on that slide here is our overall school trends. Now, the, one of the cool things in terms of functionality with this is I could add whatever layer filter on this, right? This could be year groups, it could be houses, it could be gender. Um, but I decided to start with this one first just to represent sort of like, I guess, one of our first levels of how we uh, look at trends. So within our school, you can clearly see the overregulation on the right in, in school and of, also at home is a challenge for our students. And then you can see some of the smaller ones, things like social naivety and hidden vulnerability clearly have some need there. Um, based around the need, we want to take a different approach. So the first one that um, we look at for a larger population is cohort um, plans. So if you can go to the next slide, um, maybe I can just sort of take you through step by step what that looks like, um, I guess how accessible it is and how easy it is. But you would see different plans. Um, as I mentioned, cohort would be what we'd look at first to address the broader needs of our community uh, outside of year groups um, or sp specific groups like tutor groups. Um, so you select cohort plan and then that would bring you on to the next slide. And we chose over regulation, obviously being one of the, the first trends that we saw there. And this is only a, a small snapshot of what this actually looks like. M what we're looking at here is just a few different signposts that would be relevant to um, the needs of overregulation in a population. So what that might actually look like in terms of biases or, or even how people may experience that is things like hypervigilance, uh, always being aware and trying to manage your emotion, your stress and self-monitoring yourself socially, not trying to make mistakes. Um, and you know, for anyone that's 
sat in a pastoral role, counseling role, even a teacher, we know what happens to students that do that for a little bit too long. They start to become dysregulated and they can, you know, end up doing things that might not necessarily be that helpful for them uh, or supportive for their well-being. Um, so looking at the signposts, we want to look at strategies that we can deploy throughout the entire school across the cohort. And the way it would work is you'd, you'd look through and find something that you think perhaps would be relevant to your school setting. Maybe it's something that you haven't done yet. Maybe you'll see stuff that has, has been done in there. Um, the example that we went through, if you can go to the next slide, is uh, this one. So simple action plan to address the issue. Um, in this case, we um, looked at trying to reinforce that we have a community where you can actively go and seek support. Right, that at our school we have this awesome counseling team that's ever growing and teachers that recognize the value of, of, of well-being um, and encouraging people to seek support. Uh, that's not always the easiest. It's not always internalized by people. And of course, there are a lot of barriers uh, and stigma and biases that prevent people. So one of the things that we went for was a, a school-wide thing we could deploy, which was a counseling passes. Um, and that was something that can be deployed in every year group, in every class. We had a primary school students making our counseling passes, again, sort of getting to connect with the idea that this is normal, that this can be accessible to everyone. Um, and that's something that also our staff, our teachers, anyone can also deploy uh, easily to, I guess, normalize seeking support, right? And having that cultural idea of it's okay. Um, so that would be one example of how a cohort plan would, would work. Um, I couldn't really figure out a way to visually demonstrate it without being overwhelming because there are tons and tons of really great signposts that you can have. And we're just talking about overregulation, right? That could be for any one of those composite biases or any one of those um, areas to focus on. And, and I, think that's, um, that's where that, I think that's where that key thing, isn't it, of being very precise and very strategic um, and choosing mm -hmm. these one or two sort of key messages that you're putting out and key things which are, again it, it, they're not it's not major intervention it's small everyday interactions messages model behaviors uh, that can, can make such a massive difference yeah um one of just the cool things on the side is just maybe this is me personally it's sort of like this accountability thing <laughs> it'll set you up a date where you, you you aim to review the the process and it you know emails you and tells you you know you've got this review coming up and and so um, I found that to be quite helpful. I know um, this is probably the case with a lot of school counselors. We get overwhelmed quite quickly of many different things and plates that we have to spin. So uh, I thought that was also a good function too. Um, so, so tell me, that's the cohort. Tell me, I was going to say, Joe, yes. Tell me a little bit more about your individual plans, sort of how long they take to write, uh, how easy they are to, to implement. If I move you on to the next slide. Um, yeah. There so, um, yeah, I'll start with individuals. So I, I quite like this um, interface in terms of like how you can engage with it to identify individual students and either, you know, set up an individual plan or later I'll go into group plans. But you can see it sort of highlighted two circles. Um, the one on the left is the one I want to start with with individuals. So this is grade seven, what we're looking at, right, outside and inside school. And it's looking at the population and it's categorizing them based around their biases, whether they're polar low or polar high. Now, the cool thing is with this, you, I'm not sure if you can, people in the call can see, like the one that's highlighted, that's clicked. So you can click on as many one of these and you can group them together. So it's really user friendly. But for an individual one, I've highlighted this one and I've gone, okay, right, there's sort of three um, polar biases here and this would probably be a red flag. And I'm gonna start here with, you know, identifying who this is and thinking of an individual plan. Um, if you move on to the next slide, I can show you a bit about what that will look like. So you'll, you'll, like Jenny mentioned earlier, you'll get this sort of snapshot of the student, right? And what, what I like about this person is, again, you get that historical context. Um, from a counseling perspective, it kind of lays the um, context of history and maybe showing certain patterns, uh, certain patterns over time that might be worth considering. Um, and, and also, other possible variables that lead to changes in bias because each one of these uh, biases come with their own set of risks whether that means that they're less likely to be able to successfully socialize or maybe this suggests um things like um high high expectations at home or um uh, difficult relationships with parents and, and whatever it may be so you kind of have an idea generally of doing it with this case study um the student was on our radar but i think was somebody that was very good at that.
the regulation piece. I was sort of very vigilant in trying to keep it together. Um, as time has gone on, she has sort of been noticed a little bit more with, with emotional challenges and struggles. So I think the sort of data really represented our observations in, in, um, in school. Um, what you'd come up with, and if you go to the next slide, the sort of how does it feel to be this student, um, you know, I think as a counselor, one of the, the, the great things about job is we do get that really nuanced and depth view of the student. But, you know, of course, we provide our support in, in a confidential manner. So we can't necessarily share all the information with staff that would be helpful. But with these types of, um, you know, how does it feel to be me, they're also good signposts for, you know, staff to be able to have a general idea of what it could feel like. And that could even be deployed as a, you know, this might not resonate completely, but for this student, there is a reason why they may feel this way. And it kind of destigmatizes their behavior a little bit, you know, it makes people realize like, okay, like there is a way of observing this and perhaps there is sort of a bit more empathy with when she does become dysregulated. And um, I find that to be quite useful from a sort of advocacy piece with other staff members and teachers. So that's one of the cool things about individual plans. But moving on to the next um, slide, um, like the cohort plan, you'll um, get given signposts based around the biases that exist. Um, and again, there are quite a lot of them. And um, based around some of my meetings with the student, I was looking at the ones that seemed to be most relevant based around my connection with that student. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll go through that looking at risks, of course, you're looking at the, the key things that jump out. Um, useful con for conceptualizing possible challenges. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that I, I took these as sort of rigid things that are happening, but definitely helped with sort of, you know, guiding my ideas with supporting the student. Um, moving on to the next slide, once you have these signposts, you'll sort of end up in the next stage, which is, again, similar thing, looking at action plans. So with this one, um, a big one, because the student was so vigilant, it was creating an action plan that recognized that this person may need support, but may fly under the radar. So um, I took this first, uh, at the top, what we see here is um, equipping co colleagues with proactive, consistent, um, and joined up processes to support the student. So making them aware that um, there is high pressure, making them aware that there are you know big emotions and challenges there. And then the school action here is actually written by myself based on that. And um, the big thing was help, you know, encouraging teachers to be vigilant and looking out for indicators of poor sleep quality. Um, if she's having emotional regulation challenges coming back from you know, break time or lunch time, um, or if she's showing specific Difficulty, difficulty in sustained attention on one day, that that would be very useful data to share back with counselors because that could be a sign of challenges at home. It could be a sign to do with social stuff. And it might prompt us to do a check-in that might support that student before that she becomes dysregulated. And, um, and, and that's, that took me, I would say, from sitting down, looking at the data, identifying that. I didn't time it exactly, but I put it between that sort of 10 and 20 minute range of just being able to go through that process. Now, to be fair, like that might take a bit longer if I was completely unfamiliar with the student, but those signposts again would probably make it pretty quick. And just, I'm very conscious of your time, uh, just moving sort of forward in terms of looking at a, a sort of, um, sort of very quickly looking at a, a group action plan, um, which I so see- group yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> no, don't worry. So as I mentioned on the other slide, um, the, the main difference with this is I would be grouping students. So I'd be clicking each one of these and it would, it would pop up with a huge list. I'd um, click write an action plan and then that would generate what would be on the next slide. Um, these are two groups. So on the one on the left is the grade seven group that I created for regulation. I'm also working on another group for grade eight and nines on low self-disclosure. Um, and then you'd have your separate plans within that. And what that ends up looking like is, is this. So this is a collection of all the signposts uh, in relation to overregulation. And one of the things that did jump out was um, perfectionism. Um, and that can be a very common control mechanism for a lot of people that are trying to you know, make sure they can meet those expectations and can regulate their emotions by you know, avoiding you know, friction or uh, com uh, conflict. Um, how these can be used, I think it depends on who's, who's using it. Um, but what this helped prompt me to do is formulate and design um, 
advisory content. So in our school, um, we have advisory lessons once per week for the year group where we do social and emo emotional curriculum. Uh, we also have assembly times where we can um, do uh, groups. Um, so the group would be based around perfectionism. And um, if you go to the next slide, I can sort of highlight a little bit about what I ended up with. Um, the resource and content that was developed, and this is just a, a, a summary I created for this, was a six, a five lesson uh, plan for um, addressing what perfectionism is, how to help normalize it across the group, skills and strategies, um, and, and so on. Um, and that could ideally, I'm hoping, sort of that, get that deployed where teachers can actually um, do this across idea group as well, maybe for content when we do need it as a preventative strategy for, for people that aren't in this group yet, but potentially could be in the future. Um, so I found that really useful because, you know, it did help reduce a bit of the planning time and sort of having to conceptualize it because within those signposts were, you know, some skills or maybe even some strategies that you could you can pull from. So in other words, you've got your individual plans, you've got your grouping plans as you as you put them together, pupils with the same biases. And then you've got your yep. cohort plans, those sort of model behaviors, those sort of whole uh, cohort messages. Um, but one of the one of the key things, of course, is that ability to be able to see the impact of, of what you've uh, of what you put in place to see that pupil outcome. Yep, exactly. Um, I, I think one of the cool things about this is, you know, being able to take data at different stages throughout your year. You can compare it every year and you can compare it at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. So for me, that pre and post data comparison is a, a pretty good measure, in my opinion, of sort of, you know, has there been an impact from, you know, the mixture of our plans? Yeah. And even in doing that at a specific level, you could do that at a form, uh, a tutor base level, a homeroom level or, or a year group level. And, and I think uh, if I uh, move on, yes, you can say you can see, for example, here, um, your uh, your self disclosure across the school and those and those patterns. And you can also see the impact of on every pupil who's had an action plan and, and how their data has has improved. And, and as you say, that's that's key, isn't it, really, to to be able to see how how students are progressing. Well, thank you so much indeed. Um, I think we've pretty much come to the to the end of our time. So uh, it just leaves me to say thank you so much to to Mir, to Jenny, to Joe um, for giving up your time and 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 preparing uh, all this for us. Um, thank you also to to Trevor for your input about what steer what steer is, uh, and to Claire for all your work as ever behind the scenes, making sure that we can be seen. Uh, without that, none of this would happen. But thank you so much for uh, for your time and for sharing what you're doing incredibly well um, in terms of supporting that sort of those social and emotional needs of the students in, in an incredibly powerful way. So thank you so much uh, and uh, for for taking part this morning uh, or this afternoon in your case uh, and uh, and have a, a great rest of your day. Thank you very much indeed.